Ready? This is going to be a video that falls right on from the um, Lagrange polynomials uh, uh, video from last time. I want you to make sure that you go through that, that first lecture really carefully. You do a couple of examples first because this one's going to be about coding it. And I think I'm going to be referring to some formulas that I want you to be really, really familiar with. Um, and if you aren't familiar with those formulas, it's going to be really hard to digest a lot of what we do here. It's going to be a short video otherwise. I only have a few pages to do, um, but I just wanted to chunk this section up because otherwise uh, it just would have been a really long lecture. So uh, why don't we get into it um, and talk about coding the Lagrange polynomial. So the La Lagrange polynomials are simple in that all we needed to do was apply this formula. I think that if you've done it a few times, it, it makes some sense. It might seem a little unwieldy, a little bit challenging at first, but it's really not too bad. But putting that formula into practice, like thinking about what that, those, those basis functions that are involved, the Lagrange basis functions, it's easy to kind of think, okay, you know, oh, for the second basis function, if I have four data points, I need something that looks like, you know, x minus x1, skip over x minus x2, go x minus x3, x minus x4. And then at the bottom, I would need something like uh, x2 minus x1, x2 minus x3, x2 minus x4. That would be the second basis function, just as an example. And that would be multiplied by y2 and added to the polynomial as one of four terms, because I need one for the first point, one for the second point, one for the third point, one for the fourth point. How do you tell a computer how to do this? How do you tell a computer how to build this thing? We're building a polynomial and one of the elements of that, uh, one of the, the terms of that polynomial involves this expression, which itself involves a number of different points and this idea of skipping over something. There's a lot more to this. It's easy to think of in your brain. It might cause you to hesitate and think a little bit for um, putting into practice with a computer. I'm just gonna get rid of this because it's it, this was kind of an arbitrary kind of demonstration, but reminding you of how this works. How many of these terms do we need in the formula? Well, it depends completely on the number of data points. So we need that information to start. We should have our data points. We should have the number of data points so we can work with it. And we should initialize our polynomial. That will be our final answer. That's what this P of X equals zero is. So we'll need to start with all of that stuff. Okay. And yeah, to add each of those terms, I don't know how long the polynomial is gonna be, but we need some sort of a loop. So that's going to be in play as well. Okay. So that loop should be as long as the number of terms, uh, number of points that we have, so they get the right number of terms, as we'll remember from those last examples. The complicated thing is that each of the terms within the, the, the number of factors within the term also depends on the number of points there are. The number of factors that are multiplied together um, within a basis function also depend on the number of points. And so we have to multiply repeatedly in order to accumulate that um, those basis functions. And that sounds a lot like another loop. We need to repeatedly multiply. Okay, I would argue that while the final answer, we can start with an initial polynomial of zero and build up from there. If I wanna build up a basis function, but I'm using repeated multiplications to get in every new factor, I can't start that at zero. I can't start L of X at, one, uh, at zero because if I do, and I try to multiply things by it to accumulate up the right thing, zero times anything is zero. I'm not gonna build up anything. Because I'm I'm multiplying things on to build up those, those uh, basis functions, it is best to start with L of X equals one instead because that way I know that one times a factor is the factor. And then I can take that factor and multiply by another factor and I start to build something up that way. So that's kind of how I've coded it. There might be lots of ways to do it, but once you've got this whole thing built up, that basis function, we need to multiply it by its corresponding Y value and then add the result to our P of X. Then we will have completed one full um, uh, iteration of, the, of the, the main loop and we go and start the whole thing over again now for the second basis function and the second point. So you repeat until you go through the terms and you have what you need. So I built a flow chart here um, because I thought that would be helpful. And um, there will be code as well here. So uh, it is a little bit more complicated, but for the very first time, we're going to have a nested loop. And I want to make sure that that makes sense. 
I need a big loop for each of the terms going through it. But then to make each of the terms, I need to go through and have a little loop that multiplies all of these different factors together to create uh, those basis functions. So here's what the flow looks like. We have initializations right here. Just all the basic stuff, initializations. All right, and that's just defining a basic polynomial, p of x equals zero, the l of x equals one. We need the data points. We need the number of data points. Um, this looks really terrible, but this is supposed to be initializations like that. Okay, and once you've got those, then we enter that nested loop structure. Don't let it throw you off, okay, but check it out. I have one main loop that looks like it's going this way, to there, to there, to there, and then back. But then within that loop, I have this little mini loop right over here that's going to continue to um, iterate until I've built up the basis function properly. So those are the, the, the um, two elements that are there. So let's, uh, let's look at what we have here. We're gonna consider the current point. We wanna build the associated basis function. You travel over here, and this is what this is all about. Take your initial L, which is equal to one, and you wanna multiply that by, okay, well, we wrote it down on the last page, but I need X minus a number, an X value, over the current X value minus that um, uh, the same x value, the xk. And I have to make sure that this is true, um, that this is involved as long as the k is not equal to i, right? If you think about the different factors in the basis function for x2, x minus x2, x2 minus x2, those things don't appear there, right? So if I'm working on the ith one, x minus xk, xi minus xk, the k can't equal to i. I need to multiply through, and if the k is not equal to i, multiply that on to build up that uh, those those factors to, to create that basis function. Once I've done that, skipping over the one where they would match, which would, again, like you can see why they can't, because it's going to put a zero on the bottom. There are all sorts of is issues with why not. Um, once I've got that all built up, then we go down here, we add the corresponding y value, to that basis function, we add that to p of x. So now the p of x is something more than what we had before. And then we reset the L so we can start everything over again, but this time with the second point. And then we go through and do that for every single one of the different uh, points that are involved, creating n different basis functions and adding n different terms to the polynomial. So this uh, kind of uh, lays that all out for us. And hopefully this makes some sense and you can spend some time with it, study it, and try to put, put together some code for it. Um, however, I did put together some source code that might help you do the trick. I would advise you, I would advise you to try to code this on your own because I think that would be really good practice. Um, but I can do it here within 25 lines with some extra space and so on. So I like the white space for readability personally. But let's go through and see exactly what this does. We have uh, the first steps here, are those initializations. So these are going to define um, uh, four separate points. And so those points are going to be uh, one, seven, uh, two, zero, three, two, and four, negative one. So I just kind of pulled these, you know, out of thin air, uh, but anyway, I'm going to create some symbolic variables. So initializes symbolic variables. And again, there may be different ways to do this. No worries if, uh, if you find a different approach, but this really works well for me and it works well logically. Um, and this here initializes those functions. So initializes the final polynomial and the basis function. I've called it current basis function because I plan to reuse that function. Um, once I have it built, I'm gonna add it to the current polynomial or the final polynomial, if you will. And then once I've got that added, 
the information is going to be recorded in the polynomial. I can reset the current basis function, create something new out of it, and then add that. So this is the main loop. It's right here. And you can see for yourself that we have our nested loop inside. And so that nested loop is going to go through and add together all of the different, uh, or, uh, sorry, uh, multiply together all the different factors to create the current basis function. So I want you to look at something really crafty here. I have a conditional statement here. You might wonder, what is this? So this says, if I is not equal to k. This skips over, skips over that i equals k case. Because that way, right, if you look back to the formula, we do skip over um, if those two were to match. So for the i -th basis function, I can't have an x minus x i. Right? For the k -th basis function, I can't have x minus x k over x k minus x k. That doesn't make any sense. So this is going to repeat and repeat and repeat, multiplying, check it out, current basis function x is equal to what it was times that ratio of factors, x minus pk over pi minus pk. So x minus pk is this, the function x minus whatever pk the number is, x values, and then pi minus pk are the right constants in the bottom. And then that's going to accumulate because current basis function is one to start. Now it's going to be this other thing. And then if that goes through the loop, it's going to multiply it and continue multiplying until it's built up the whole thing. Once you're through, once you're through to the number of points here, that inner loop is going to finish. You're going to have the whole basis function created. And then check this out. This is the whole created uh, basis function. I'm going to multiply that by the Y value. And then I'm going to add the result to the current polynomial. And then in that way, um, we can go back to the start and start creating another basis function for another point and continue to add more values to the polynomial. To do that, I have to reinitialize the current basis function. That's this one. And that's to make sure that you're not building onto the one you just built. You need to build a new basis function. So um, reinitializes the basis function. Um, to, I guess, I, I'm going to say to build the next one. And that's going to happen on the next pass of the loop and so on. And then finally, once you've gone through all of the different points, all of the different basis functions, of course, you want to show off your answer. This just displays the result. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. It's a little bit more tricky with that nested loop there, but um, think about all of the things that are being are, that are involved there. Spend some quality time with this code. Again, I would urge you to try and put it away and try to code it yourself. Um, but yeah, that's what I want to talk to you today about. And we have one more uh, chat that we have to have, and that is about uh, the problem of um, one more application that we can use uh, Lagrange polynomials for and then some issues that might come up when using interpolation. And that might force us or cause us to think a little bit about different kinds of approaches. Um, and there are, there's a lot more that we can do. So we are gonna put this away for now. Uh, uh, stay tuned for the next video that will kind of finish up the conversation on Lagrange polynomials, but there are gonna be other kinds of polynomials that we can consider in light of that conversation. So um, ciao for now. And I will see you in the next one.